how it might work with everything else. And again, for those of you in technology, this is probably nothing new to think of it this way. You can put anything at the hub of this figure. But what's different in this case is that in healthcare, too many of us are not used to thinking about it this way. And in healthcare, unfortunately, more than in many other fields, we have a lot of regulation and a lot of requirements that make it a little bit tougher. But essentially, on the vertical axis, we've got internal data that lives inside our system, gets created in our system. We've got external data coming from outside the system, and this is important stuff. This could be stuff that, that we have locally and we're interfacing it from another system or that we're scanning in. But much more importantly, it could be data that our patients are sending us or that we're getting from devices from our patients, stuff that we're maybe sending out and getting back in through an API, information stored in a data warehouse, anywhere else. There's a lot of external data that we need to handle and massage and make good use of. And then on the other axis, we have the internal users, clinicians, researchers, administrators in our system with security rights that are fairly easy to manage. But very importantly, on the other side, we have our external users. That's administrators and clinicians and researchers at other institutions who want to share the data or give us data. But most importantly, it's our patients and their caregivers, what we call proxies, with whom we very much need to interact. So I have a rhetorical question. I don't have an audience response system. But I want you to think for a moment, what does a good EHR system, or really any good IT system, have in common with a baseball umpire? And if any of you are baseball fans, you know that the answer is, if they do their job well, they fade into the background and get unnoticed. They just work, and you don't really know they're there unless you really need to know they're there. But the information still flows, and in the EHR condition, it flows with proper security, so when it needs to flow, it does. And when the figure updates, it just is gonna show you some arrows. Maybe I didn't click the button well enough. Uh, there it is, there's the arrow. So the information flows and circulates, and no one needs to know that the EHR was doing all that, it just happens seamlessly, integrated, without having to think about it. That's the vision. Now at Johns Hopkins, again, we're focusing on our external users, we're focusing on our patients and their proxies, and we're also focusing on the data they're providing us. So we really wanna emphasize patient-centered care, and of course, that's just medicalization of client-centered service, and all of you know about the importance of that. So we're trying to do that. So now I wanna be a little more interactive by show of hands, just thinking about technology and client-centered service, how many of you interacted personally with a travel agent to get here to this meeting? I see maybe a dozen hands at the most, okay? How many of you have walked into a bank and interacted personally with a bank teller in the last 30 days? A few more hands, but a tiny minority. You're using technology instead. Why aren't we doing that in healthcare? Well, we're getting there. We're catching up fast. We now have patient portals. We can now enable our patients to schedule appointments, view their upcoming appointments, cancel and reschedule their appointments. We're letting people check in remotely from home, from a kiosk, provide some information while they're checking in, review the data that we've got in the system already, notify us when there's an error in the system, update us when there's new data coming in, send messages back and forth in a secure way, protecting all the privacy and following all the regulatory rules. And we can go beyond that. We can make the medical office visit unnecessary in many cases. If we just need to exchange some information, we can do that remotely with asynchronous messaging and capture that as part of the medical record. And why not capture telemedicine technology as well? Capture the video, capture screenshots, make notes about that interaction electronically, and not make the patient come in if we don't have to actually physically touch them. So again, we're playing catch up, but we're catching up fast. Currently at Johns Hopkins, we have 165,000 patients enrolled in our portal. That's just in the last 18, 19 months. We're adding another 10,000 every month, and we currently have an average sign-up of 26%, which is good. I'm not nearly satisfied with that. Some of our providers are up around 80, 85% patients signed up. Some are lagging behind, and we're working to bring them along. And our activation rate is constantly rising, about a percentage point higher every month. And we're trading a lot of messages. Since Go Live, we've exchanged 800,000 messages with all of our patients, and that's ramping up quickly. So a year ago, in October of 2013, 34,000 messages back and forth in that one month. Last month, October of 2014, 81,000 messages. One-tenth of all our messages happened last month, and that's gonna keep rising exponentially. So we're getting better, we're playing the game better, to catch up with our technology and provide healthcare the way other industries use IT for their services. We're stealing bases, we're moving the runner over, every now and then we hit a home run or even a grand slam, but that's not good enough either. 
We want to do what Billy Bean did with the uh, Oakland A's. We want to do what Earl Weaver did with my favorite baseball team, the Orioles, back in the 70s, and now Buck Showalter is doing with the Orioles. We want to use statistics and evidence and, above all else, data and data and more data to disrupt and innovate and change the game fundamentally. We're still playing the same game, but we want to play it so much better that it looks different and it works better. So how do we do that? Again, it's about the data. And let's just think about a few areas. I don't have time. I could stand up here all day and tell you cool ideas, but I don't have that time. What about medications? We already have pill bottles that can count how many times they were opened. We have inhalers that can count how many times they were activated. That data can be transmitted to a mobile device, to a wristband, to a desktop computer. It doesn't matter where. But why stop with that? Why can't we have medicines themselves know their status and broadcast that status? Why can't the medicine actually tell the patient and the healthcare system, as it's sitting in the bottle, is it still active or has it started to deteriorate and lose its potency? Not the standard expiration date that's printed on everything. Look at your bottle of water, it has an expiration date. I've never figured that out. I don't care if an artificial date has passed. I'd love the medicine to tell me if it's still potent or not. I'd like to know, is the medicine still in the bottle or is it in the patient? Once it's in the patient, I want to know, has it been activated or inactivated? Has it been properly absorbed? Has it been excreted? And not only do I want to know that as the doctor, I want my patient to know that so we can all work together as a team to use medicines more intelligently and to help us understand what's going on medically. What about monitoring, biometrics, a wealth of data? Most of you know that you can check your blood pressure at home, you can check your blood sugar, you can check your temperature, your weight, you can use a Fitbit and a Y things and a smart scale, and you can get all this data back, and we can bring that into the medical record system also. But why stop there? Many of you probably know that smart contact lenses are being developed that can monitor the sugar content of the fluid around the eye, the tears. But why not go beyond that? Why not think about other therapeutic devices, whether wearable or implantable, and make those monitoring and reporting devices also. Why not hearing aids, pacemakers, implantable defibrillators, artificial joints, stents in arteries? They should be able to report back their own status. Are they functioning properly or malfunctioning? But they should also be able to monitor the fluid surrounding them, measure those biometrics, report it back to the patient. Here's how you're doing. It looks like you're getting sick. Report it back to us on the healthcare side, again, so we can all work together and improve health. That's just technology, it just needs to be built. And what about the genome? You've heard about the genome a couple times already. The genome is a really big place. One cell has six billion nucleotides. This is big data. It's now fairly trivial to get that information. And again, you heard that yesterday about TGen. We can actually sequence a genome for the price of an MRI. The price of an MRI. Now, we need to manage that data. And actually, it's a fairly trivial concept to just access it, store it, manage it. That's not so bad, but we need to do better. We have to interpret it. We have to display it in a way that's usable, both for the clinicians and the patients. And even that's not enough, because everyone's unique. We need to know, for this patient, what does that genetic change mean in the context of all the other things that we know about their healthcare? We need to integrate that data with their medical history and everything else we know about them, including their environment, to finally bring it together and deliver personalized or precision medicine. We need to think about the genomics, the medicines, the allergies, the biometric data, all the stuff I just told you about, all of the other test results, but that's just scratching the surface. We need to think about the physical exam findings. We need to think about everything we know about the environmental exposures, the known past diagnoses, the family history and other medical history, all the medical literature, and this is a problem too, because most of what we have documented in the medical record is unstructured or at best semi-structured data. So this isn't just, okay, build it into the algorithm. We need huge technological advances on text analytics and natural language processing and massaging all this unstructured stuff into discrete machine-readable language that then allows us to pivot the whole thing and deliver enhanced research and generation of new knowledge by pulling all this together and asking the statistical question what matters and what doesn't and then returning that back to the healthcare environment to provide clinical decision support exactly when it's needed. 
and have the system notify both the patient and the healthcare provider, it looks like you're getting sick, you might want to take this medicine. You might want to make, get an appointment. The computer, we heard some about what Watson can do, and Watson can do great things. But why not enhance that and really personalize and use that clinical decision support just in time to really change all of medicine, change the game. Improve assessment of any one person's risk of developing disease. Develop personalized screening and surveillance approaches tailored to that person's individual risks. When symptoms develop, use all that information to prioritize the possible explanations, the differential diagnosis, and then go beyond that to developing a personalized therapeutic plan that we have much greater confidence will succeed and achieve the desired goal with minimal side effects. That's my vision of the future. I wanna thank Dell for inviting me out here to share it with you. I wanna thank you for your attention, but most of all, I wanna thank you in advance for the work that I'm hoping many of you will do to try to bring that vision to reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. That was absolutely fantastic. And let me introduce you to Dwight Rahm. He's the Chief Technology Officer at Johns Hopkins, and we're gonna have a brief conversation on this amazing vision that you just laid out around how IT and technology and patient data can really come together to deliver amazing things for patients at Johns Hopkins. And everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dwight, let me start with you. Um, how has this vision and what Johns Hopkins has been working so hard on doing. How has it changed how you and Howard and the medical staff partner together? Sure. So you have to understand that to roll out a, a large application like our EHR, it requires literally hundreds of people. And the communication and collaboration that's necessary to do that is, is pretty immense. And it really requires a, a true team effort between IT and our clini clinical staff. Uh, on a very much ongoing basis to, to achieve all these, these wonderful things that we've done so far. And that means- If I may interrupt, yeah. by ongoing, at six o'clock this morning, I was on a phone call, and I've got another one two o'clock this afternoon, and typically around one o'clock every morning, I'm emailing back and forth with my IT counterpart. So that's partnership. Building new things. Yes. Yeah. Great partnership. Ongoing, ongoing all the time. Ongoing. All the yeah. time. So. Yeah. And, and has anything kind of changed in that relationship when you think about what IT needs to be doing and um, how you continue to, to evolve the role of IT? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think bimodal is a very popular buzzword right now, and I think it describes the situation almost precisely for us. Um, Howard used the, the analogy of, of baseball. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run with that for a second. Uh, what we're doing in healthcare right now at Hopkins is really just trying to get to 500. The EHR is, is a new system, but it's not really novel or unique. Many other industries have already done these kinds of things very successfully. And I would, I would argue that getting a successful implementation of an EHR is just getting to 500. That's important, right? That makes us competitive with everybody else. But we've got to work to, to fine tune that system, fine tune our processes, make sure it's as, as efficient as possible. But to really become a contender, to really change medicine and, and the vision and delivery of healthcare, we've got to move beyond just 500. We have to innovate. Now, healthcare is, is very much a, an industry that's been driven by vendors. We're so highly regulated that our, our, our space is dictated by a few major vendors out there. But it's important for us to not allow them to be the only ones that define innovation for us. We really have to, I think, take the initiative and provide an environment and an ecosystem that allows not only uh, uh, ourselves to, to um, innovate, but also new startups to, to actually create new ideas, to actually transform the way we deliver medicine. Wow, wow. So there's, um, there's a real cultural element of what you all are doing at Johns Hopkins to really kind of embrace and incorporate that entrepreneurial spirit, is what we call it at Dell, yeah. in, um, in everything that you do. Again, it was, it was very clear from the beginning, and it still is, we have a clinical project with IT support, and that's critical because you're not gonna get the buy-in. And, and it's this whole concept of, of change culture and getting people ready for change. And if we've got a clinician who's just stuck in the mud and says, the way I do it works, I don't see why I have to change just because meaningful use came along and I'm supposed to submit some data. That's nonsense, it doesn't make my patient healthier. Show me the data, right? We need everyone on board. We need everyone to feel included and like they're part of the team. And really coming back to the question of how does the economy change and how do jobs change? 
we all need to be a little malleable in what we do and what we specialize in. So a lot of our IT folks on the project are nurses and physicians and, and social workers and healthcare providers who are really strong in IT and they're on the IT side of it. Sides is the wrong word. But there's also folks like myself. I see patients every day, but I've also gone to class and learned how to do some of the build myself. So I've got a short leash, but they let me raise the hood and change the oil. I'm not allowed to rebuild the engine, but I'm allowed to go in and tinker a little bit. So I understand some of the complexities of the IT build and the IT folks understand why it's not so simple to just tell a clinician to go do it and it happens. We need to work together. Yeah, it's truly a partnership. I mean, we in IT, I think our role is to not only articulate the, the art of the possible, but then also to just not accept the status quo. You know, we, we, we have to continuously improve uh, our delivery and our execution of, of the EHR, but then also look for new ways to, to really just change the entire dynamic. One thing I also mention, and, and Hopkins is not unique in this respect, but we've We've uh, just launched a new uh, innovation center. It's a technology innovation center. And the idea is that we'll partner uh, not only within Hopkins with researchers and with, I with people who have great ideas and, and find ways to, to innovate and, and create new technologies, but we'll also partner with industry. I think one of the real challenges of IT and healthcare is that it is such a regulated space that it's very hard for startups to, to get any kind of penetration into the market. Um, so this innovation center and, and many others like it are intended to, to provide a nice, warm, uh, and cozy place, if you will, for innovation to occur and for partnerships to occur. That's fantastic. It's fantastic. Clearly, the, the examples that you've given the, the audience are a real testament to why Johns Hopkins has been such a successful institution for 125 years. So, Howard, Dwight, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well done. That was a great look at abundance in healthcare in an established market. Now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and our next speaker is gonna be sharing some incredible experience working to grow abundance in emerging markets. Jessica Jackley is an entrepreneur and an investor focused on financial inclusion and the sharing economy. Many of you probably know Jessica as the co-founder of Kiva the world's first crowd-funded micro-lending website. Please give me a warm welcome and help me welcome Jessica to the stage. Good morning. I'm gonna be the camp counselor and ask you to say it again. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's great to be here. Um, I'm really, I was so honored to be invited to join you all today. I've admired Michael Dell for a long time, what he's built, what he stands for, what this amazing company does. And some of the things that I've, I've heard over the years have really inspired me. One thing in particular that has really resonated deeply with me is this. He said that technology is really about enabling human potential. Until my early 20s, I was not somebody who would have said that I was interested much in technology, if I'm quite honest. But I became a believer over time as my entrepreneurial journey unfolded, and as I saw the power of technology to do just this, to tap into human potential, especially for some of the most overlooked entrepreneurs in the world. 10 years ago, I started Kiva, uh, the first person-to-person -person online micro-lending platform, because I wanted to tell my friends and family, it was a simple reason, I wanted to tell my friends and family a new story about poverty and about potential. Now, new story. What was the old story? Well, for me, it was a story that I heard again and again growing up from well-intentioned nonprofits that focused on a thread of the story for so many people on the planet that was based on sadness and suffering, desperation, and hopelessness. For me, <laughs> as I heard these stories, I mean, I think I had a natural human reaction. I felt sad. I felt terrified, overwhelmed disappointed, maybe even a little bit angry, um, and kind of hopeless. And even in places where I thought I might hear a slightly um, more encouraging message, I still took in, for better or for worse, I took in the parts that made me feel panicked and bad about the situation of poverty in the world. Even in Sunday school as a kid, I remember my Sunday school teacher talking about how Jesus said the poor would always be with us. I mean, I remember vividly, I was five years old, and I imagined in my mind a long line of people who needed me to share my stuff with them, who were never going away. And it, 
scared the pants off me. <laughs> I, I imagined that they would never go away and that the problem of poverty would never go away with this long line of folks always over my shoulder. Um, so my response to the story, of course, was that emotional one that I talked about. And I, I was feeling, as I felt heartbroken and sad and guilty, if not shameful, about my own relative middle class American wealth. Those feelings actually were exactly what I was supposed to be feeling, according to the carefully crafted marketing campaigns of so many, again, well-intentioned nonprofits that wanted me to feel enough. They wanted me to, to push me enough, push all of us, I think, enough so that we wouldn't change the channel, but instead would just want a way out. And of course, at the right, at, you know, at the last minute of the commercial or the message, there would be the perfect solution. Just call this 800 number, and with cash, check, or money order, you can, you too can save a child's life. So don't worry, let us solve the problem for you. Not necessarily with you, but for you. Um, and so I did. But at its worst, this was really just a transaction, that my deep desire to serve the poor, to be connected with other human beings on the planet, to be useful in their lives, had become a bit of a transaction. I was throwing my change in the jar, so to speak, sometimes quite literally, so I could go on with my day, go on with my life, and not have to hear those sad stories anymore, at least for a minute. And it worked temporarily. I felt a little bit better every time I did that. But there was a consequence um, to that reaction. I mean, in the short term, yes. A lot of great organizations got my time and my money, and that was good. <laughs> I'm, I know that many of them have done good work, um, and some people were helped because of those small efforts growing up. But the relationship that I had, as I, as I look back over the first, say, two decades of my life, the relationship that I ended up having with the poor didn't exist anymore because I, as again, I think many of us do, as a defense mechanism, I had sort of created a barrier. I'd rolled up the window. <laughs> you can always see it. But there was a distance and a barrier between me and other human beings on the planet. It's kind of a sad thing. But thankfully, as a recent college graduate, I started to hear, I glimpsed a little bit of a new story, and it was thanks to this gentleman. I was working at the Stanford Graduate School of Business as an administrative assistant, um, and I, I was around a lot of amazing individuals who were doing my dream jobs that I wanted to go do someday. I had no idea how to get there. I didn't know how to go from where I was to what they were doing. But I was doing my best to learn and to absorb everything that I could and kind of <laughs> get a free MBA on the side as a staff person. Didn't work. I ended up going back and paying for it, and it was good. <laughs> but one day after work, I heard this gentleman, Dr. Muhammad Yunus, speak. And he talked, of course, about his story, pioneering modern microfinance. When I heard him for the first time, it was the fall of 2003, three years before he and his Grameen Bank would win the Nobel Peace Prize for their pioneering work. So I'd never heard of him before. I just went and crashed this lecture. <laughs> and he talked about microfinance, financial services and products for the poor. He talked about microcredit in particular, one such product, a small, small loan for the entrepreneurial poor, often to start or to grow their businesses. And maybe most importantly, he told his story in an incredibly accessible way, and he talked about connecting with the poor in a way that wasn't scary or intimidating to me, and I had no desire to create a barrier with the people that he was describing. He talked about individuals who, yes, had financial needs, but they were smart, strong, hardworking individuals who actually just needed access to a resource that I had had access to my whole life. They needed a small loan. And they, in fact, didn't want endless handouts. They didn't want to stand in line forever behind me and follow me around. All they wanted was access to this resource so they could lift themselves out of poverty. I was so intrigued that I quit that job and I moved to East Africa to spend time with these people that I'd wondered about for my whole life. And I spent a few months in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania interviewing them, hearing their stories, and in fact validating that Dr. Yunus hadn't been lying. He had been telling the truth. There was another side to the stories, um, their stories that I hadn't heard before. I met people that, you know, God forbid, were smiling and happy with their lives. Yes, had needs, but were were optimists about what was next for them. I met people who had already had great success, maybe had started with a needle and thread under the shade of a tree, and now had an office and capital equipment. I met people who just, I would encounter them in a scene of abundance versus a well-crafted photograph of somebody with scarcity all around uh, for a marketing brochure. And that changed how I felt. I met people who offered me things. It was shocking. They didn't have empty hands waiting for me to give to them. They were offering me things. They're, incredible generosity even in the midst of great need. So these stories changed how I felt, they changed what I believed, they changed what I thought was possible for other, other people on the planet, and they led to the creation of Kiva. We put these stories, stories as the entrepreneurs themselves told us, myself and my co-founder Matt, onto a website, spammed our friends and family, said, hey, this person doesn't even need a donation, they need a loan, do you want to chip in? 
And overnight, about $3,000 came in for our pilot round of loans. As those entrepreneurs paid back, we took the word beta off of the site. I always like to talk about our very illustrious beginnings. <laughs> that was our big launch. Take a word off of the website, and then you're real, right? Um, that next year, somehow, we facilitated 500,000 in loans. The following year, it was about 15 million. The next year, 40 million, and on and on. Today, Kiva's facilitated um, around 630 million in loans across the planet with very <laughs> yay lenders. <laughs> Thank you. So it's, uh, it's been so fun to watch. And these are just some shot shots of Kiva today. Now, and it's not just on the other side of the planet. Uh, it's all over the world. We're in the US, too. Small businesses create 2 thirds of jobs in this country, and yet 7 out of 10 are turned down for bank loans. Every day, that's 8,000 that are turned down for loans to grow. So Kiva and Kiva Zip are participating in filling that gap as well. So that's Kiva. What I want to talk about. Um, what I realize now is that while Kiva was this specific passion project, over the last few years I've been able to step back and get some perspective and realize that we were early in the trend toward a sharing economy. And when I talk about sharing economy, just think, the easy way to think about it is a world moving more towards access and away from an obsession with ownership. Um, there is enough to go around. It's just a matter of unlocking the assets that exist out there and the resources that exist. And of course, technology is what enables us to do this. <clears throat> now, if you think about what this means for you, what does the steering economy mean in my life? Well, you might start to ask yourself questions more and more, like, why would I go through the hassle of buying a car when I can just rent from my neighbor, um, or hitch a ride with a Lyft driver, or Uber my way somewhere? You might ask, well, why would I buy an expensive outfit if I can just rent it from an organization from somebody else on the other side of the country and give it back? When I'm out of town, why not rent out my home or my apartment on, um, on Airbnb, things like that. So all the assets, all the resources that we have that are so often left unused, I think are gonna be, we believe, in the sharing economy, are gonna be utilized more and more. Um, <clears throat> and I believe that'll be good for the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for the last few years, one of the things I've been doing is working with a fund called the Collaborative Fund that really is focused on investing in these entrepreneurs that are championing the sharing economy that believe that this story is real and is what's unfolding for the world, again, towards access away from ownership. And of course, they're utilizing technology in really fun, incredible ways to make this sharing happen quickly, efficiently, and inexpensively. So what's the point of all this? And I'm, by the way, I'm one slide off, so can you stick on this slide after I say what I'm gonna say? <laughs> so don't ignore my next forward button, okay, great. I'm talking to God, I guess. Um, so what's the point of all this, <laughs> of all these exciting new platforms that allow us to exchange resources and to connect with each other in different ways, bartering, renting, swapping, even giving things away for free? I think the point is about what I opened with. It's about unlocking human potential. It's about allowing people to have access to resources they might need to realize their own potential, to pursue opportunities. So why isn't it happening more quickly? I think it's because we get focused on the wrong stories. Of course, technology allows us to have access to so much information. I'm preaching to the choir here. And that's a good thing, and information is good. Uh, but I know when I live at that level of big statistics and I look at something like this versus a specific story of a specific person, I don't feel much. I, get, I feel a little bit numb. I experience what has been called compassion collapse, when you just get inundated by big, scary, sometimes very heartbreaking statistics about the world. And it's hard to think about what change really looks like. But I think, and, and then sometimes when we, thank you, we're all caught up, Sometimes when we do hear stories of individuals, they're not the right stories, they're not the truest version of the story. So I think the work for all of us is to really believe deeply and thoughtfully and without hesitation in the potential of other people, everyone, every single person, um, and that every other person out there in the world is worth investing in and sharing with and from. So I think we need to practice seeing possibility and seeing potential in every person around us. So as we think about what we, the lucky ones, that get to build and design and create and invest in these great new technologies, um, what are we designing, for whom, why? Is it based on trust and a real belief in the potential of every, every single person out there? I think for me, when I do lose sight of that or when I hesitate at all, <clears throat> the cure <laughs> is to zoom back in, uh, to zoom back in and savor the details of one individual story. There's one that I love to tell of a brick maker that I met in Uganda his name is Patrick, and he literally started, he, he fled the northern area of the country, this is not him, it's just a lovely picture, <laughs> but he fled the northern area of the country 
after rebels attacked his village, and he started with nothing in a new village on the Kenya-Uganda border. And he describes, it was years earlier, um, after I'd met him, but he describes how he sat on the ground wondering how he would feed himself and his younger brother that day, and like he did every day. And he digs into the earth with his bare hands, <laughs> realizes he's, he's found some clay deposits, digs that up, gets a stick, gets other implements, starts to mix that with water, makes a very rough shape in brick, and does that again and again, starts a brick-making business. By the time I had met him, and you know, you, you can imagine how the story unfolds, saves enough money from those rough, sun-dried bricks to buy a brick mold, makes two at a time, then makes four at a time. They're more evenly and smoothly and consistently shaped and sized, he can sell them for more. Learns how to make a self-contained kiln, and on and on and on. When I met him, he had several employees and was thriving and pointed out all the buildings in his village that he had made with his bare hands. And that's not an entrepreneur, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, that's what I do when I start to doubt or start to wonder about whether or not things can really get better in the world and whether or not human t potential really exists. I think of people like Patrick. And to close, um, I believe stories shape us. They shape how we feel, what we believe, and how we choose to live our lives. Um, and they're how we teach each other. These are my two, uh, my two kids. Of course, we have one more coming. I know I'm not showing, but <laughs> um, <laughs> one more coming quite soon. But my husband and I tell them stories every night. Um, and we were reading through, is the longest book ever for them yet. We read through Charlie and the Chocolate Factory a few weeks ago. And they just turned three, but they have so many questions. And they asked, Mom, why is Charlie Bucket poor? I'm not kidding. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not ready for this question. Uh, but I explained that unfortunately not everybody gets to have the same things in life. Not, every, not everybody gets to have the same opportunities. Mama, what's opportunity? <laughs> uh, I told them it's like a turn. They're really good at taking turns. Um, when you get an opportunity, it's like you're getting a turn to play or to learn or to try to be your best. Mama, why doesn't everybody get a turn? <laughs> well, I guess I told them some people aren't really good at sharing sometimes. Um, and that's probably the biggest reason why not everyone has enough turns. And they said, well, that's not, that's not very nice. <laughs> and I would agree. <laughs> but I think it's easy to change. I think we have what we need to share. I want to encourage us to build things that help us be nicer to each other. Um, and we can use the incredibly powerful tools that we have today to give each other more turns. We'll all be better for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank that, you. Was, that, that was awesome. Thank so you. hopefully you're going to return here on stage at Dell World next year, and there'll be three yeah, that's little the ones. I'll be up, differently shaped. I up feel there? Like. No, that's, uh, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Really great. You, um, you just talked about the power of technology to bring so many people out of poverty through something as simple as kind of the mobile phone. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give folks in this audience, some of the most technologically savviest leaders in the world and what they can do to accelerate social entrepreneurship? It's a wonderful question. I think entrepreneurship, of course, isn't just about going off and starting an organization from scratch. I think we can live and work entrepreneurially no matter what our work is. You all have particularly amazing opportunities to do that, you and your teams. So I think to promote entrepreneurship, to encourage people to take risks, um, to brainstorm new ideas, to try things, particularly where it's maybe not clear if there's a traditional market that exists already, but it could be of real value to the world. I think that's really important to do. Um, and to encourage the people that you do see out there, I mean, find a few to just make your people. Encourage them, mentor them, give them specific positive feedback and support as they go along their journey, and celebrate the ups and downs with them. I know that for me and for every other entrepreneur that I know, every other social entrepreneur that I know, it's a little crazy making, and so to have people that in really support you as a, an individual human being on, along the way, I think is one of the most important things you can do. Well, I was just talking to our next speaker backstage, and she was talking about how She's much of a mentor you have friend. been oh. to, to her. So what's next for you? So I, um, I have been besides watching. Besides having a baby. Yeah, besides this, <laughs> this is a kind of important thing. Um, thank you for asking that, too. So I've been working with the Collaborative Fund. I have a book coming out in June. Lots of fun, small things going on, but I, um, I started a consultancy in a design firm with a friend, called her up last year when she was having twin boys, and I said, you're going to be okay, but I'm here if you need me. Uh, and we reconnected over um, a topic that is near and dear to both of us. We've been watching our business school friends and so many others, especially women, right as parenthood hits and other life changes, other transitions. 
not be able to stay with the work that they're very good at doing and that they want to do simply because company policies don't allow, there aren't technology solutions, there aren't the logistics in place to allow them to job share or something else. So we started this firm to work with companies to encourage new ways of thinking and to design new programs and innovations around supporting those working parents and supporting anybody and everybody that wants to actually have um, things outside of life that require a little bit more flexibility. So we've been having a lot of fun with that and a lot of success with that. Good for you. Thank good you so you. much. Well, good luck with that. Thank good you. luck in the next couple of weeks and it's fantastic to have Thank you here. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. such a pleasure. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you all. So now we'll move from microfinancing entrepreneurship to funding caregivers, also in emerging markets, where our next speaker will show you how it's dramatically improving local health care. Our next guest is Shivani Garg Patal. She is the co founder of Sama Hope, an organization with the mission of connecting doctors to patients who are in desperate need of care through the power of technology and people. Please help me welcome Shivani to the stage. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Karen. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Shankar Rai. I met Dr. Rai a year ago in Kathmandu, Nepal. There I learned that Dr. Rai grew up from pretty humble beginnings in Nepal. He worked his way through a lot of dedication, hard work, determination to become a physician, then a surgeon, and now a world-renowned reconstructive plastic surgeon and a humanitarian. See, Dr. Ride has dedicated his professional life to serving the poorest of the poor in his country. He exclusively treats children with congenital deformities like cleft palates and cleft lips, and women and children suffering from severe burns. These are the conditions that plague the poorest of his country. Preventing these, these patients from economic progress, forcing them to suffer needlessly from conditions that are in fact treatable. Dr. Rai treats patients like Bishal. Bishal sits here in his mother Basanti's lap. He's two years old. Now Bishal comes from the western hills of Nepal. And as you can imagine, it gets really cold there, especially in those cold winter months. One of those cold nights, Bishal accidentally crawled into the fire that the family uses for heat and for cooking. Tragically, he suffered from multiple burns and wounds on his face, his arms, and his hands. Now, Basanti is a sole caretaker and income earner for Bishal. She works at a brick factory in the hopes of one day earning a living wage. She traveled for six hours to seek emergency care for Bishal. Unfortunately, she was not successful. No one in her village, the local health posts, or the district hospital were able to treat Bashal's wounds. Now, Basanti knew that without treatment, Bashal faced a life of disfigurement, disability, probably wouldn't be able to go to school, and given the fact that his vision and his breathing were being, becoming compromised, it was very likely that Bashal was going to have a shortened lifespan. This was not the future that Basanti had envisioned for her son. She was determined to get care for him. And in time, she found out about Dr. Rai. She did everything in her power to get Bishal to Dr. Rai in Kathmandu. She actually also sold half of her family's farm just to pay for transportation to Kathmandu. Once she got to Dr. Rai, Dr. Rai was miraculously able to help treat Bishal. Bishal is now on his way to recovery, and very soon he will be going to school. Now, Bishal is one of the lucky ones. Dr. Rai tells me he sees patients like him every day. In fact, he could treat 100 more patients like Bishal each year if he just had the funds to do so. That's where Sama Hope comes in. So Sama Hope is a crowdfunding platform where anyone anywhere can fund the work of doctors like Dr. Rai. Doctors who are treating patients living in the poorest communities around the world. These doctors, to me, they're entrepreneurs. They see the reality of global healthcare delivery in their country, of healthcare delivery in their country, and they refuse to accept it. They see opportunity where scarcity is where others see scarcity. To me, they're inspiring and unsung heroes. Take Dr. Jovich, for example. 
Dr. Jovich is the only reconstructive plastic surgeon for all of Zambia, a country of over 15 million people. Dr. Jovich actually taught himself to become a pilot so that he could fly a small prop plane out to the outskirts of Zambia in the rural areas to treat more patients in need. To me, that's pretty entrepreneurial. And now he's focused on training the next generation of reconstructive surgeons so that access can increase in the country and they don't have to rely on one person. At Sama Hope, we focus on funding doctors like Dr. Rai and Dr. Jovich so that donors can connect directly to them. Let me share a story with you. This is Tiange. Tiange is 17 years old and she comes from a rural village in Sierra Leone. Now before the Ebola epidemic, Tiange still had a really difficult life. At the age of 12, she was raped by her English teacher and became pregnant. Now, like many, American, not, like many African women living in rural Africa, she delivered at home without any skilled birth attendant by her side. Tiange was in labor for five days. Five days without any painkillers, without any sterilization. As a result, she lost her child, and she suffered from a birth injury that left her incontinent. This birth injury prevented Tiange from being able to go back to school. She suffered silently for four years. After four years, a van pulled up to her village. It was full of community health workers who came to share a story about Dr. Maggie, a doctor a few hundred miles away who actually could treat the same birth injury that Tiange had. He could leave these women dry, give them back their hope, enable them to realize their potential. Tiange's uncle heard about this and found ways to get Tiange to Dr. Maggie. With the help of 20 donors on Sama Hope, Dr. Maggie was able to get the resources he needed to treat Tiange. Tiange is now back in school, thanks to donors like Peter, a retired zoology professor from Norway, and Amy, a college student from Wisconsin studying political science. With the power of the internet, Sama Hope was able to connect Amy and Peter and Dr. Maggie to change Tiange's life. This is the power of the crowd. This is the power that each one of us has. Now, Peter and Amy, they receive reports from Dr. Maggie every month. They hear about patients he was able to treat, the impact that their dollars as donors has had on his work, the trials, the tribulations, the challenges he faces, and the success stories. That's the communication and the relationship that will now build over time. Now, we're just getting started at Sama Hope, and we've been able to fund treatments for nearly 1,000 patients with the support of 8,000 donors providing access to care to patients who otherwise would not be able to afford it. These patients are able to go back to work, go back to school. This has direct economic implications on their families and their communities. At Sama Hope, we aim to reach one million patients via our platform. We look to fund additional neglected needs in global health such as funding the training of medical talent locally so that we can further increase capacity and access to care, or medical infrastructure that is designed specifically for these low resource settings. By democratizing giving, Sama Hope empowers each one of us to end the needless suffering for millions of women and children. And I hope that today each of you will consider and realize the power that each of you have to change a life. Thank you. Shivani, that was incredible. I, mean, I was sitting backstage with the other speakers, just so inspired by all of your stories and all of the great work that you that you have done. Thank you. You know, you and Jessica just spoke about the power of crowdfunding yeah. and the role that technology is playing to democratize um, all of what it is that you all are doing. We heard from Johns Hopkins and the great work their hospital is doing and their passion around advancing technology to improve the outcomes for patients. How do we take all of this great work and these amazing visions and, um, and make it a reality? Yeah, um, well, I have one idea, and I think we can do it right here in this room. Okay. So if everyone, does everyone here have a mobile phone? 
Can Light everybody your hear? Phone. Put your mobile phone up in there. I see lots of phones. Pull it out. I see my colleagues so, on the front row. Pull that's pretty incredible, right? We all here have mobile phones. If everyone goes to samahope.org slash doctors right now and picks a doctor that they would like to fund, if each person here gave $5, we could change the lives of 100 women and children, of hundreds, actually, of women and children today, right now, in this room. Wow. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, I, I actually love how you, you, you've made it real, right? Putting a name with a face and giving them a sense of hope and, 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 and everything. Um, just kind of one final question. So yeah, sure. You're, um, you're, you're an inspiration to so many and a successful entrepreneur. What advice would you give to other entrepreneurs? Sure, um, that's a great question. I think that there are many highs and lows that you face through an entrepreneurial journey. And when you have you know, life's changes matched with that, it becomes even more difficult or more challenging and more exciting, and more of an adventure. So I just recently gave birth to my first child. Um, I'm a proud mother of a six-month-old six daughter. Congratulations. And you know, that adds a whole other level of highs and lows. Okay. And I think that the one thing that has stood out to me and the one piece of advice that I would give to other entrepreneurs is that during those moments, you need to surround yourself with your biggest champions, your biggest supporters, be it your mentors, your family, your friends, your advisors, because those are the people who will pick you up and encourage you in those times and reinforce why you did this to begin with. Yeah, very good, very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Shivani. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we just heard three incredible examples of the power technology has to foster hope, progress, and global achievements in, in many, many markets. To close, I'm honored to welcome up our final speaker for the day. From established markets to emerging markets, technology is clearly enabling this next era of abundance. To tell us more about humanity's greatest challenge, abundance for all, and the role that technology will play, please help me welcome Peter Diamandis to the stage. Thank you, Karen. So I have had the pleasure to run a couple of extraordinary organizations, the XPRIZE Foundation and Singularity University. And during the course of this, it's become clear to me what I've been seeing is that we're heading towards an extraordinary world, a world in which we're gonna be able to meet the needs of every man, woman, and child on this planet. And I remember hearing you know, this young couple talking about whether it's moral to bring a child into this world. And I said, what world are you looking at? The world I'm looking at is extraordinary. And so I took the time and it really flowed out of me with a passion to write this book called Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think. And the book really talks about what I'm gonna share with you is this extraordinary future that we're heading towards, that we're hurtling towards. And I had the pleasure just last month to be the closing speaker at the Clinton Global Initiative. And there's nothing better than having the President of the United States thump your book for you. And as I, and he did this, and he interviewed me as, at the end of, of CGI, he said, Peter, why are you so positive about the future? And I said, you know, two reasons. One, I look at the data, and the second is I try and not watch the news. And so let me start with that second one first, and it's something very serious. We're living during a day and age where the news media is a drug pusher, and negative news is their drug. And in every device that you have, your smartphone, your tablet, your computer, your newspaper, your radio, your TV, you're being fed negative news over and over and over again, 24-7. Every murder on the planet you know, delivered to you directly in high definition in your living room. And you have to ask yourself the question, is there a reason for this? Is that really the worry the world really is? And I would posit it's not. But the fact of the matter is, as we were evolving on the savannas of Africa as humans, back then, if you missed a piece of bad news, your genes were out of the gene pool. And for that reason, we evolved an ancient piece of our temporal lobe called the amygdala. And the amygdala scans everything you see and everything you hear for negative news. And when it sees negative news, it puts you on high alert. You pay 10 times more attention to negative news than you do positive news. And it's for that reason that the news media feeds it to you to deliver your eyeballs to their advertisers. 
And so the question again is, is that the way the world truly is? And I would posit it's not. I would posit that today, if you look at the last 100 years and look at the data, it's been an extraordinary century. The per capita income for every nation on this planet has more than tripled. The human lifespan has more than doubled. The cost of food has dropped 13-fold. The cost of energy has dropped 20-fold. The cost of transportation, 100-fold. And of course, communications, thousands of fold. This was the cover of The Economist from last year. We're heading towards the end of poverty. We've taken billions of people out of poverty with the tremendous work that you've just seen on the stage and more coming every single day. My friend Steven Pinker at Harvard just wrote this book called The Better, Better Angels of Our Nature, which he shows us we are living during the most peaceful time ever in human history, right? But you wouldn't know that watching the crisis news network or the constantly negative news network, whatever you want to call CNN these days. And when you look at the data, it's extraordinary. Even the people below the poverty line here in the United States, the poorest, 99% have electricity, flushing toilets, running water, roof over their heads. You know, 95% have a television, 88% have a telephone, and nearly three quarters have a car and air conditioning. The robber barons, the wealthiest on this planet, didn't have that 150 years ago. We are raising the poverty line. And so I study this. I study this at a university. The question is, why is this happening? And it's not we got better politicians. We haven't gotten smarter. It's been the impact of technology, the technology that you use, that you help create on transforming this planet. And so I study this at a university. I had a chance to co-found with Ray Kurzweil called Singular University in Silicon Valley, where we study exponential technologies for our graduate programs, our executive programs, our innovation partnership programs. And it's these technologies that are tremendous levers to change the world. In fact, at this university, we challenge our graduate students who are starting about 15 to 20 companies every year to start a company that can positively impact the lives of a billion people within a decade. Because that's the world we're living in today where you can start a company, a product, or a service that can touch the lives of a billion people. It was never like that before. And so, as I look forward to this, <clears throat> all of this is being driven by this curve. This curve is out of Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near, and it shows the five paradigms of computational power. It's the amount of computational power that $1,000 could buy you over the cost of the, cost of the last 110 years. And on this curve, what you see is this tremendous smooth curve that we're using faster computers to design and build faster computers, to build and design faster computers, and it's likely to continue for some time. And what's driving this is what I want to show you here. So this is the first integrated circuit from Intel, you know, circa 1958. It's two transistors connected together and therefore an integrated circuit. When Intel put their first 4004 processor out in 1971, here we see it with 2300 transistors, you know, about a buck a transistor. The 2012 NVIDIA GPU, the graphical processor unit, had 7 point billion transistors, right? It is literally a hundred billion fold improvement. And it's this huge capability that's underlying, if you would, a whole slew of different technologies. So all of these technologies, infinite computing, AI, robotics, synthetic biology, are all riding on top of Moore's law. If you would, it's the substrate, the foundation upon which the tools that we have to change the world are growing exponentially. And again, as I said, it's these tools that are ultimately giving us the power to solve the world's biggest problems. And just to give you a couple of examples to bring this home, I love this. This is Steven Sasson, the guy who came up with the first digital camera at Kodak in 1976. It was 0.01 megapixels, right? You can imagine walking into the boardroom of, of Kodak and saying, here it is, the future of Kodak. And of course, they ignored this and filed chapter 11 in 2012. And this is where the, code, where the digital camera is today. It's a billion times better. 
But this is where it is today, right? It doesn't stop here. The march of technology continues. And what's it gonna be 10 years from now, it's a thousand times better, or 20 years, when it's a million times better, or 30 years, when it's a billion times better. Maybe it will be sort of high definition insect eyes woven into the fabric of your clothing or in micro drones in the air or on the walls. Whatever it is, it's the march of technology continuing. This is the first inertial measurement unit that got us to orbit, got us to the moon. You're able to tell velocity and acceleration. Of course, where it is today is you know, under a buck on your phone. And where it's going is molecular machinery again woven into everything that's manufactured. And we forget and take for granted this extraordinary rate of technological progress that makes this kind of power available to a teenager in Mumbai for nothing, where it was really the consummate total of the entire Apollo program to get something like this. And of course, this is the first GPS, 120,000 bucks, 53 pounds. Imagine this thing on the dashboard of your SUV, all right? And here it is today a few bucks on your phone. So when I think about this, I realize that technology is a resource liberating force. Technology is what takes what used to be scarce and makes it abundant. So in my book, I open with a story of aluminum. The guy on the left is Napoleon III. The year is 1840 and he's invited the dude on the right over for dinner, the King of Siam, and he's the royal guest. And to try and impress the King of Siam, Napoleon at the Palace of Versailles feeds all of the troops with silver utensils. Napoleon himself eats with gold utensils, but the royal guest, the King of Siam, he's fed with aluminum utensils. Because in that year, aluminum was the most precious metal on the planet. Even though the Earth's crust is 8.3% aluminum by weight, all of the aluminum is bound with oxygen and silicates to form bauxite. You can't go dig it up out of the ground. There's no pure aluminum there you can pull out in the chunks. And it was so energetically difficult to extract the aluminum from the bauxite, it was worth more than gold and platinum. Which is why in that same decade, the tip of the Washington Monument in DC is capped with aluminum. And then we invented this technology called electrolysis that made it so easy to extract the aluminum from the bauxite. We now use it with throwaway metality, you know, aluminum cans, aluminum foil, and think nothing of it. So the question is, where else is there something that we think of as scarce that truly can be abundant with the available technology? I love this story. Friends of mine in Silicon Valley right now are working on creating artificial perfect diamonds at, well, not five bucks a carat, but 20 bucks a carat. You can imagine when, you know, for the women here, when your fiance comes in with a 10 carat ring and you go, come on, that's 200 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so what else do we think of as scarce that is contextually wrong, because I would posit that there is nothing that is scarce. It's a matter of how you think about it, and almost anything can be turned into abundance. So I'll give you one fun example. One of my companies that I'm very proud to be the co-founder and co-chairman of is a company called Planetary Resources. The question is, are you know, strategic metals or platinum group metals scarce? Well, it turns out that in our solar system, there's some 60 million asteroids. And of those, about one and a half million are the size of a kilometer larger. And of those, a thousand or so come very close to the Earth. And it really sucks when they hit us. But a lot of them don't. And when you look at it, there's a number of Manhattan Islands, very low-hanging fruit that come close to the Earth, about 11 of these. And these 11 asteroids are extraordinarily valuable in fuels and in platinum group metals. So here's just one example of one of those asteroids. It's got a great name, 2011 UW-158. It sort of rolls off the tongue and onto the floor. It's a half a kilometer by kilometer in size. It comes by the Earth every 1.9 years. And its value is $5.4 trillion. So my goal is to go out there and capture this thing. Of course, I'll buy, I'll buy puts on the platinum market before we do that. <laughs> But I'm serious. We are building the spacecraft right now. In fact, here's the ARCID 300. Uh, Chris Lewicki, our 
present chief engineer with Larry Page, one of our first investors, and we're building these kinds of spacecraft to go out there and prospect these resources. Because really, it's contextual. Maybe it's scarce here, but the Earth is a crumb in a supermarket filled with resources. What about energy? Is energy scarce? And the answer is, of course not. We are living on a planet that is bathed in 5,000 times more energy from the sun than we consume as a species in a year. And if you've got abundant energy, you have abundant water. And here are the numbers, right? It's the plummeting cost of solar globally around the world at the same time that production rates are exploding. My friends Ray Kurzweil and Elon Musk tell us that we're probably within the next 20 years able to meet 50 to 100% of our energy needs in the US from solar. And if we have abundant energy, we have abundant water. We live on a water planet. Two thirds of our planet is covered with water. Yes, 97.5% is salt and 2% is ice and we fight over half a percent. But there's extraordinary technologies coming down the pike with nanomaterials like graphene or my friend Dean Kamen's slingshot. This is a device about the size of a dorm room refrigerator that operates on 100 watts, less than a hairdryer, and generates 1,000 liters per day of clean drinking water. It has two hoses. You stick one hose into anything wet, the latrine, arsenic-infected water, the Pacific Ocean, and out the other hose comes water so clear, so pure, it meets the medical standards for injectable water. And right now, Mutar candidate Coca-Cola, the chairman of Coca-Cola, has put these devices into test in countries around the world. And the goal is put one of these devices in every village. This Maasai warrior on a cell phone has got better mobile comm than the President of the United States did 25 years ago. And on Google, on a smartphone, has access to more knowledge and information than President Clinton had 20 years ago. And by the way, on that smartphone, as well as the information, that Maasai warrior also has two-way video conferencing, HD video, HD stills, you know, literally stuff we would have spent thousands of dollars for, hundreds of thousands of dollars for 20 years ago. They are living in a world of information and communications abundance. What I'm most excited about this next decade is the disruption and transformation of learning and health. So as an example, I run the XPRIZE Foundation. I'm very proud of that. And it was two and a half years ago that I had lunch with Paul Jacobs, the chairman of Qualcomm. And over lunch, we we're talking about, wouldn't it be great if the Star Trek tricorder existed? Remember that thing that, Bill, that, that, that Dr. McCoy Bones would say, Jim, he's an alien. You know, would be able to diagnose you instantly. And so we shook hands on it and then developed what is now the $10 million Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize. And this is an X Prize that asked teams to build a handheld mobile device, not for doctor or nurses, but for you, for all of us, for the consumer, for the mom or dad at two o'clock in the morning when your kid is sick. This is a device you can talk to, it's got AI on the cloud, you can cough on it, it can do the RNA or DNA analysis of the bacteria in your saliva, you can do a finger blood prick and your blood chemistry is an in success. This can diagnose you better than a team of board certified doctors. Now we announced this X Prize at CES two and a half years ago and had 330 teams enter in the first year. We're down to the top 10 and we'll have a winner by this time next year. At the Clinton Global Initiative, at the Social Good Summit, at the UN General Assembly last month, I had the honor and pleasure to announce our latest X Prize called the $15 million Global Learning X Prize. And today we're living in a world of nearly a billion illiterate people, people who cannot read or write or do basic math. Two thirds of them are women, 250 million of them are kids. And the challenge is that we can't build enough schools or teach enough teachers to scale to that level. So this X Prize is asking teams to build a piece of software that can operate on any Android app any Android uh, device, a phablet, a tablet, a phone, that can take a child where there is nothing, no literate adult, no schools, nothing, from illiteracy to basic reading, writing, and numeracy in 18 months. 
And unlike our other X Prizes, in this X Prize, the winning software is going to be open sourced. Our goal is put it on every device that's manufactured. So every device out there becomes a teacher. Thank you. Back. I'll wrap on these last few slides, which I think is one of the most important for all of us. So this is the world's population. We just crossed the seven billion mark. If you're worried about population, don't be. There's two things that, go, that help a nation go from positive growth to negative growth rates, and Bill Gates has an amazing TED talk on this, which I commend to you. And that is making the world healthier and better educated. You do that, and population growth rates plummet. But that's not the point of the slide. The point of the slide is this. In 2010, we had just shy of 1.8 billion people connected online. By 2020, that number will go to at least 5 billion. If my friends at Google and Facebook have their way, it'll be 7 billion. So the question is, when 3 billion new minds enter the global economy, what are they gonna want? What are they gonna buy? What are they gonna desire? What are they gonna invent? For me, this represents the greatest era of innovation ever because these three billion new minds are coming online at a time where they have access to the world's information, cloud printing, AI, robotics, synthetic biology, extraordinary capabilities. They also represent tens of trillions of dollars flowing to the global economy. If they're not your customers, they're your customers' customers. So, if you'd like a copy of the slide deck, you're welcome to it. If you just text your first name and email to this number, you'll, my server will download it to you. But let me close on this notion. We're living during a, an extraordinary time, perhaps the most extraordinary time ever to be alive. Today, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. You want to become a billionaire? Help a billion people. And the ability to do that is like never before. Thousands of years ago, if you wanted to touch the lives of a nation or a region, you had to be the king or the queen. A hundred years ago, you had to be a robber baron, an industrialist. Today, all of us, any of us, passionate about solving a problem can. It's an extraordinary time to be alive. Truly, a world of abundance is ahead of us. An honor and a pleasure, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was fantastic. And, you know, if you haven't read Peter's book, I would strongly recommend it. I have, re I have uh, read his book, and it inspired me. And as I've thought about our business and our, and our future, uh, you know, the, the kind of ideas that he talks about uh, are tremendous. You heard terrific insights, tremendous reasons for optimism. The future is incredibly bright and you, our customers and partners, and our team members at Dell are why. So thank you for letting us be uh, a part of your stories and your success. We wanna thank you for spending your valuable time with us here at Dell World. And with that, uh, we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Dell World. Everything's changing every day. Coming to events like this really keeps us on top of the ball and, and what's happening in the marketplace. Dell in general has brought together a lot of partners and a lot of customers. I found it very resourceful from information that I've learned while I've been here and the people I've met as well too. In Dell World this year, we're gonna tell a story about practical innovation at scale. Not just transforming our own corner of the world, but collectively transforming the world itself. So I think that there's a lot more around solutions. Dell is coming to customers and providing something kind of end-to-end, -end, software to stack, to hardware, to services, to really combine, to meet customers' needs. Dell has traditionally been known mainly as a mover of boxes, hardware manufacturer, but now it's much more. Now they are teaming up with all these partners. Individually, we're doing amazing things, but together, we are a movement. Actually, it's a little bit more exciting this year. I like the fact that they bumped up uh, the entertainment a little bit. I was 
just telling one of my contemporaries, it's like coming to a mall for IT. It's one-stop shopping. It is very useful because all the vendors that are here, you can just talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, and if you have any questions, they know the answer. Well, it's been a great opportunity to meet other uh, entrepreneurs and other companies, some of them very established. Very innovative people, very innovative minds, and always thinking about how we can all work together. I think of Dell as more of a community than a company sometimes. I wind up talking to people that I may not have expected to meet, you know. I walked away thinking I was just going to come and hang out and walk away with, I understand something. I just found something new. Whether it be uh, a VP of sales at Dell or a sales rep or some of their partners, for the most part, these relationships have all turned into, into, into good friendships. I would definitely say if anybody gets a chance to come, they should get on down to Austin. My experience at Dell World has been phenomenal. Today we are the fastest growing large integrated IT company in the world. And I want to thank you for your business.
Hi, I'm George Matthew, President and CEO of Altrix, and you're watching theCUBE. I'm Dimitri Zemin, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Stackstorm, and you're watching theCUBE.